but it's almost guaranteed to be more expensive than the one alternative. And so, compound the fact that train tariffs don't exist in the back. What do I mean by they don't exist in the back? Well, let's say Brazil wanted, no, let's say China wanted to enact a tariff on Brazilian imported uh, cocoa beans. Because they wanted to grow their own cocoa beans and they make their own cotton. Well, Brazil would almost certainly respond with a retaliatory tariff on Chinese imported goods, so Fuji, for example. And as a result, the consumer base in both countries will have suffered and suffered. They'll have suffered from reduced choice, higher costs, and lower market penetration. Everyone loses. Now, this is just one hypothetical example to illustrate to you how interlinked the global economy is today. What if I told you to consider the, two, the world's two largest trading partners starting a trade war with each other? I can tell you this much. It wouldn't just be blue sheets and cotton. And that's exactly why it's so alarming when the executive of the United States proposes to enact a 45% uh, import tax hike on all Chinese goods entering the country. To really understand the reasoning behind this, though, you have to understand the political context in which this statement is made. You see, even though in an aggregate poll of over 70 economists, respected economists from prestigious universities like Harvard and MIT, 95% of economists agree that the long-term gains made free trade outweigh the short-term costs of employment. It's undeniable that free trade causes unemployment. And that's one of the major downsides to free trade. Sure, we all enjoy cheap, affordable goods, but at what expense? Thousands of fellow countrymen in your country and women will lose their jobs. So, let's take a real-life example of this with uh, math. NAFTA stands for the North American Free Trade Agreement. We signed it on 1994 by three countries, the United States, Mexico, Canada. The goal was to eliminate all trade barriers uh, in and out of all three countries so that the flow of goods could be easier. Less tariffs means more profits to the companies. It's better for everyone. Although it did make cars and some other manufactured goods cheaper for Americans, it also cost Americans about 700,000 jobs. 700,000. Mostly in the field of manufacturing, especially in the field of auto manufacturing. And of course, the reason behind this is, it's cheaper to make cars in Mexico than the United States. Wages there are lower, costs are lower, the companies know this. They will outsource their jobs to minimize their costs. So what happens? You're left with 700,000 unemployed Americans. Whole towns that were built in the 60s around these manufacturing plants disintegrated. I mean, how could they survive without their main source of employment, the main source of income being injected into these communities? It just went up and left. And so it's understandable that a lot of Americans, especially in rural, uh, less areas with less access to education, why there would be so much discontent with free trade. I mean, to them, and means loss of their livelihood. So to be fair, Donald Trump's claim this is a proposal for a 45% import tax hike. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of the need to address the downside of free trade. But the problem with his proposal and his solution is that it's a misguided attempt to try and stop an inevitability. It's impossible to stop an inevitability guys. NAFTA is just one early indicator for the eventual uh, elimination of all trade barriers across the world, all economic forms. And it's become increasingly apparent that the most efficient outcome for both producers and consumers, people who buy and people who sell, is to stop impeding natural market forces, to eliminate trade barriers. These market forces are making it clear. Countries with the most competitive uh, wages can make price, and can make products at the lowest prices can sell their goods the most. 
And it's this fundamental truth that makes it impossible for the job market of 1960s America to ever come back again. A time period in which you can step outside and your job will land at your feet. No longer is it possible to graduate with a high school degree, to graduate with a high school degree, the willingness to work will guarantee your financial security. And this is even true for China. It's becoming true for China. This cost efficiency rule has manifested itself with manufacturing jobs in China now moving to Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. The, the jobs that are available as a whole in the manufacturing sector, they're declining. This is a definite trend, and it's not going to end uh, when I finish this talk. It's going to be a permanent trend. So, if that is true, then what is the solution? Do we go back to trade protectionism, and enacting tariffs, and starting trade wars? No, we don't. That's not the solution. So short-term solutions that I thought of is job restructuring, government assistance programs, and a fundamental restructuring of the whole labor supply act. We need more education. That's, that's been the general trend for years. But I want you all, actually, to consider this question. How do we reconcile huge wealth gains for consumers with the equally huge income inequality increases caused by free trade? I want you all to try and answer this question. Because if you're like me, and you enjoy any luxury good, cars, computers, phones, then you have to understand it's all made possible by free trade. Thank you.